Well, I'm joined today on the podcast by Mike Rowe, who I had a great conversation with a number of weeks ago on, on his podcast, and we had enough to talk about that we wanted to pick up where we left off. And uh, Mike, one of the things I wanted to talk to you about was, you know, where, where we left off last time, I think we talked about the virtue of hard work. I think that meant something to us. But we were just starting to talk off air, and I just said, "Hey, let's just turn to the camera and and, and do this." How many is, times? How many you know, times in doing this podcast, Vivek, have you have you realized some of the best stuff happens right before and right after you stop rolling? All the time, all the time. And so I'm just like, "Why are we? Why are we drawing the distinction?" Uh, that's kind of the whole point of the whole thing. So let's just let's let's honestly pick up where we left off. I, I was asking what you're in the mood for, what, what you're in the mood to talk about today. And you started telling me, I was like, wait a minute, let's just turn this thing on. Well, yeah, thank you. Um, I run a foundation called Microworks, and it evolved very organically 15 years ago out of a show called Dirty Jobs, which I'm still working on, which has been around forever. And um, the point of Microworks was to try and make a, a persuasive case for 2.3 million open jobs. This is back in 2008. You'll remember in those days, the headlines were obsessed with the number of people who were unemployed. And on my little show, Dirty Jobs, everywhere I went at this time of record high unemployment, all we saw was help wanted signs. And so that's when it first occurred to me that, you know what, there's another narrative going on in this country. And it has to do not just with employment or unemployment, but with the very existence of opportunity. A lot of people think and thought, and I think still believe that unemployment can be cured by creating more jobs. But the skills gap shows us that that's really not the case at all. And in fact, today, I think the latest numbers, you'd probably know better out of BLS, but it's like 9.5 million open positions. M most of those jobs don't require a four-year degree. They require training. They're the kinds of jobs that we featured on Dirty Jobs for decades. And so I started a foundation called Microworks to try and shine a light on existing opportunity because so many people, Vivek, just were under the assumption that opportunity is dead and under the further uh, misassumption that um, the way to fix it was just to create more jobs. And so I've been doing this for about 15 years and somewhere along the way, about 10 years ago, we started offering work ethic scholarships specifically for kids who didn't want to go to a four-year school but who wanted to become steam fitters, pipe fitters, welders right? Uh, technicians and so forth. Anyway, it's been a, it's been a slow, steady um, increase. We're moving the needle, right? And it's really hard to prove that the ship is turning around when you're talking about debunking myths and misperceptions and stigmas and stereotypes. It's, it's hard to measure that. But over 15 years, you can. And so what I was telling you all fair was that I'm finally kind of coming out of the closet with this thing in the sense that I've, I've been beating up Congress for years. I've gone to multiple you know, committees and I've testified about the need for some kind of PR campaign on a national level to make a more persuasive case for all these jobs and to try and get shop class back in high schools and at the same time try and tell kids that the best path for the most people isn't necessarily a four-year degree. That's been... That's been my priority on the foundation side. It's starting to happen. The headlines have caught up to my own smack. I've decided rather than wait for the feds to do this campaign, we're just doing it ourselves. We film dozens of testimonials with people who have gone through our program, welders primarily, who are now making over six figures a year mm -hmm. with no college and no, no debt. debt. Yeah. That's right. So- that's what I'm doing. I'm I'm taking the foundation to the next level. I'm still working on a bunch of the shows I've been working on for the last few years. But this this thing that for a long time was a planet in my solar system, the MicroWorks Foundation, has become the sun. And everything else I do, books, public speaking, podcasts, TV shows, endorsements, whatever it is, it's all revolving around that thing. And so I'm, uh, I'm excited to actually say that out loud and to, uh, and to keep pushing the rock up the hill. You know, I, I, was, I was thinking about this. I learned a little bit more about what you do after our last conversation. And I, part of the reason I love it, Mike, is that 
there is this temptation. Uh, people in my seat fall into it maybe all the time. Maybe I fall into it sometimes. I don't know. Of thinking that there's a problem and that it is government's job to solve that problem. And then even further, that's not generally my impulse, but that there's a government created problem and therefore it's government's job to solve that problem. I think that part of what you described in the skills gap is largely, I think, a government created, government subsidized problem. But even still, the thing I love about you is you didn't wait for government to come fix the government created problem. Actually, private action can still fix a lot of government created problems sooner than government can fix the government created problems. And I appreciate that about you. Well, thanks. Look, I think that language is super important. You're awfully good with it. And I think I think the term you just used is kind of worth kicking around. Problem, obviously, you look around and you can make a long list. We seem to be beset with problems from every possible angle. But I wonder sometimes how many things we see as problems are actually symptoms of some underlying thing. Like the skills gap is a really interesting topic. Uh, many people, some economists, really believe it's a myth. They just think it's it's not real and that it could be solved simply if these greedy, rapacious employers started offering more money. And it's simply a matter of supply and demand and market forces and so forth. Other people believe it's it's much, much worse than than reported. Personally, I I've evolved a bit. I I I absolutely think the skills gap is a real thing, but I think it's also a will gap. And I think that, you know, the it's not a great mystery why we have 9 million open jobs, 1.7 trillion dollars in student loans and 7 and a half million able-bodied men affirmatively sitting out the workforce. These are symptoms, I think, of a larger underlying belief. Uh it's a value system. We've had our thumb on the scale for a very long time with regard to the kinds of jobs we deem to be aspirational, with regard to the types of education that we think, uh, well, again, back to the language. With education, you've got higher education, and then presumably you have everything else. Now, we don't call it lower <laughs> education. Right, 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 right. But we but think you treat it, that, it way. that way. But you treat we it that way. Yeah. We we actually do have a word for it. It's alternative, alternative education. And then you have subcategories of alternative education, like vocational, right? That, but they all become these subordinate alternatives for people who seemingly weren't cut out for the best path for the most people. And so, yeah, I I think that it's very difficult to talk about problems without talking about uh, symptoms. And I think it's hard to talk about any of these things without being super mindful of the language that we're using and all of the preconceived nonsense and baggage that unfortunately comes along with it. Yeah. A couple interesting thoughts there as just as you're talking. I mean, think that actually I'm curious for your view on this. You did make the point about somebody being able to get the job as a welder or plumber or whatnot make six figure salaries without debt. That's a enticing economic proposition relative to somebody who's graduating with a four year college degree and is saddled with debt that leaves them further behind in the workforce. Kind of an an interesting question if you're to make kind of a prediction now and roll this forward a few years. Do you think that dynamic mostly changes the underlying problem, even beneath the symptom of bringing up, I was reading between the lines of what you're saying, but the cultural cachet and expectation, and then language is a expression of what your underlying cultural norms and values really are. Do we see it? Do, do you predict that change tracking the economics or, and, and I, I could easily imagine it. I'm not sure what I think about this. Do you think that there's just more of a departure between cultural hierarchy that sort of departs from economic hierarchy as they've mapped onto each other for the last 20 years? Maybe they come apart, but we have two different kinds of sort of social structures and honor hierarchies. I'm curious for your take on which way you see it breaking. Yeah. Look, I think 
you didn't intend it to be a trick question, but it is because it presupposes the idea that I'm going to be able to say something that applies evenly to a lot of people. And I don't think I can. I used to think I could. And the temptation to try and sum up, as you know, I mean, in politics, it seems to me that you're in the business of saying a thing that resonates with the fat part of the bat, right? Like to get your show renewed, to get elected, to get your product sold, you have to say things that apply to large numbers of people. But when it comes to things like job satisfaction and educational um, efficacy and so forth and so on, so many things impact it that I think the best we can hope to do is be mindful that of all the things we can't control, one of the things that we can is the prevailing definition of a good job. That's actually in our collective ability to shape and argue about. As attitudes change and as language evolves, I think tech plays another role as well. You know, when I, I mean, and full disclosure, I went to a community college for a couple of years, and then I went to work, and then I went to a university, and then I got a bachelor of science degree, of course, in communication and speech with a little bit of English and a touch of philosophy. Great. Um, that served me really well. It didn't get me a job by any means, but it served me really well, and I still recommend a liberal arts degree uh, to people in general because it makes you, I think, a more interesting person. But look, Vivek, I got this thing in my hand right now. I don't know if we're videotaping yeah. this, but yeah. All right. So my my smartphone with my internet connection now gives me something I didn't have in 1984 when I graduated from Towson. It gives me access to 98% of the known information in the history of the world. I, I just watched a, a, a lecture uh, at MIT two weeks ago for free. The same exact lecture that people are paying an awful lot of money for. So, you know, is an online course, is it really fair to compare that? You know, probably not head to head, but you have to at least acknowledge the fact that the access to everything that I learned anyway in, in school is now available for free. And so to me, that changes the proposition a little bit. If, you're, if you want your kid to have something to fall back on, well, by all means, learn a skill that's in demand first. And then if you can afford some sort of four-year degree or some sort of liberal arts pursuit, by all means, do it. But if you can't, don't despair. Look around. Wondrium, great courses, the, the internet itself. So I just think for anybody with a curious mind that has access to the available tech and is willing to learn a skill that's in demand. I don't think there's ever been a better time for that person to be entering the workforce because they have at their disposal an arsenal of tools that I certainly didn't have growing up. And I bet you didn't either. Yeah, I didn't. You, you're you make me think about some particulars here. Um, I'm sure you've thought about this, what you're doing through your, through your nonprofit work. <sighs> The thing I love about the way you're talking about this, Mike, is that there's a lot of people who have adopted your punchline, right? But without the nuance that you just drew. And, and actually, I what you said speaks to me because I actually did take a lot away from my liberal arts education as well. It was the right path for me, even though I recognize as a policy matter, the fact that we have wrongfully created financial incentives to skew people in that direction and to take debt while they're at it that creates exactly the pragmatic worker shortage that we face in this country and the opportunity that somebody could have to actually take a different path if we just didn't distort their incentives to see it. I see both sides of – I see both of those things as being true at once. And what I worry about a little bit is people in what I will call our movement, right? So this provocational movement latching on to a anti-intellectualism that is unnecessary because it's not it's not really what motivates what we're saying or why 
But, you know, you think about like, the, you know, Thomas Jefferson, right? He, he invented, I'm sitting on a swivel chair right now. You can see me swiveling one way or another. He invented it. I was it. wondering what you were doing there. I thought you were levitating. Yeah. No, no, it's just, just, I wanted to clarify that for the record. <laughs> but, uh, but the swivel chair was invented by Thomas Jefferson, actually, mm -hmm. while he was writing the Declaration of Independence. You know, you know, Benjamin Franklin, the Franklin stove was invented by Benjamin Franklin as he was ideating the vision for a great nation who gave us the freedoms that you and I enjoy. And, and I just think part of the American way is that there is an element of both of that that is at our nation's heart, that daring, ambitious quality of what we make and what we create through our own hard work, but through a level of curiosity that abounds. And, and I, it would be a shame to sort of see the pro work, pro skills training based mentality that folks like you and I would like to bring to bear in our culture, to ha have a casualty of that be that any intellectualism that sometimes, if we're not careful, kind of goes right along with it. I, th I think you you may see what I'm saying here because <laughs> you just said it. Look, it's such a problem, Vivek, because it's not, that's a self-inflicted wound. That's an unforced error. Yeah. Yeah. It's an own goal. We, yep. We we did that, right? And so it's it, it's kind of like I never really understood why the Republican Party and conservatives in general sat back and watched as the call it kindness was was arbitraged out of their platform. Somehow or another, they accepted the idea that that okay, you're cold, you're uncaring. You're ruthless. You don't have a heart, right? All of that stuff. That's a that's a branding proposition, and it was foisted upon one side by the other, right? So the same thing happens here. If you if you talk about the PR that surrounds um, skilled workers uh, or, or blue collar and or both, right? Then you know, we get pulled into this weird false binary world where it's like, okay, so if we're skilled in work, that means we're not entrepreneurial or that means we're not fundamentally curious the way our white partner, uh, our white collar counterpart might be. So we can't let those things go. And it's, it's really... It's not like the the skilled labor movement or the unions or or anybody who who sees themselves as fundamentally skilled wanted to divest themselves of traits like entrepreneurship, individuality and curiosity, but we let it happen. And and so, you know, there was a moment, you might remember this in uh, 2016 during the uh, during the Republican debates where Marco Rubio had a huge applause line. I forget what the setup was, but he basically said, you know, what this country needs uh, is not more philosophers. We need more welders. And the crowd goes crazy. And the next day on my social channels, I've got thousands of people saying, hey, man, this Rubio guy, he's really singing your song. And I had to say to people, you know, pe people who follow me and people who support my foundation I had to say, look, he's actually not singing my song. I, I don't have anything against philosophers. In fact, I, don't, I think it's kind of important. I think what our country needs are, are more philosophers who can run a straight and even bead with a welding torch and more welders who might be able to contribute to a conversation around Nietzsche or Descartes or, or whomever, you know? So... So the idea of being a well-rounded, curious person who just happens to make 150 grand a year welding or looking after your pipes, that's an image we have to get back. That it's just it's just critical. Otherwise, we're just going to be left with these one-dimensional notions of hardworking people possessed of some level of skill but who are really not very well read and who frankly need to be taken care of by some, either their employer or their union or, or somebody, right? And I just, I just hate to see us give up the entirety of who we can be in service of some platitude. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it's, it's a reductionist. I mean, frankly, Mike, before you and I met the way you're, I, I'm like, 
have my head in the sand at times. And so there's various parts of popular culture that just never found their way to me because whatever. But but I didn't know Dirty Jobs until it was in the context of the first time you and I were set up to chat. And then I learned about it. But my impression was that you would be the caricatured face of that Marco Rubio punchline, which which I still think is like making a valid enough point. So I want to engage with it, but it's not really the whole story. But there, there's a depth and nuance to your perspective that's sometimes lost in the Twitterification of it. And, and I think it's important that we celebrate the totality of what it means to be a contributing, thinking, independent-minded, functioning worker in an economy or even citizen of a nation of which part of it is being a productive worker. It, it, you know, I, I might even go one step um, further than you in terms of maybe you made two different lanes. I might make four actually, which is, I, I agree, I, I agree the 100% of what you said. Welders who have at the tip, at like all of us do now, fortunately at our fingertips and internet that opens up a uh, knowledge base that actually some of the most intellectually curious people I've met surprises some of my old classmates and you know neighbors in Manhattan when I say this is people in the people that show up at our campaign events in Iowa or New Hampshire or Michigan as we travel this country many of whom did not have more than a high school degree but often know more about central bank digital currencies than my former colleagues on Wall Street right and that's not a dig at the Wall Street it's just an interesting fact it's just it's just yeah. true because curious hungry independent-minded people armed with an internet can so secure knowledge for themselves. But welders who happen to know something about philosophy and philosophers who know how to make something with their hands. And then there'll be people who are philosophers that literally you couldn't make them particularly good at doing things with their hands. And that's okay. I know people who fall in this category. Sure. There's part of me that falls in this category. I'm not going to, you know, it, I'm not going to pretend to be something I'm not either. And then there's also people who might just be exceptional at making things with their hands that just don't have an innate interest in philosophy. And that's okay too. But the plurality of each person being able to achieve their own fullest potential, for some people that will be a well-rounded potential. For some people it will be actually a particularly salient unidimensional skill that they just want to cultivate and make the best version of themselves. That's what we need to provide more space for such that my path today is really, or at least maybe not today, but for much of the last 20 years has been the only path to living your American dream. But in fact, what, true pluralism is my path can't be the only path, but my path still can be a path, but it's one among many available for self-actualization. That Well, you can see why it's such such a conundrum for people who are trying to cut through and say a thing that resonates with the masses. We've entered <clears throat> into the era, the era, I think, of specialities. I think that's what you're saying. You know, um, there was a time not so long ago, a generation or two, when you really had to be a generalist. Most people needed to be way more well-rounded than they are today. Um, certainly that came out of the agrarian movement in this country back when 90% of us lived on farms. A farmer then, as today, needs to be a, a weatherman and a veterinarian. They need to be an economist. They need to be a horse trader. They need to be really good at a whole lot of different things. And so because of that, I think there was a time when we really did hold the Renaissance man or woman uh, in in a state of reverence. You know, like we that's what we we loved that. That's that's, that's Harold Rourke, right? From the mm -hmm. from the Fountainhead. Totally. That's Ayn Rand. That's that's you know, being a whole person that requires you to be able to change a tire, fix your brakes, balance a checkbook, pay your taxes, maybe offer some useful advice to your kids. I mean, you just have to be able to do all that. When, when, when we get into this other mindset, I think we run the risk. Like if we all become specialists, 
what what kind of world does that mean? Right. And you can look around and you can see how that's impacted the trades. You can see how it's impacted everything. You know, I did a campaign a couple of years ago for a company. I pitched them this idea that they actually ran with called I got a guy for that. Right. Because that's kind of where we are now. You yep, know, yep, yep. I've got a guy. You got for a that. carpet guy. You got a, yeah. you know, you got a, you got a roof guy. You got a gutter guy. You know, who's your guy for that? You got a tax guy. Right. Who's your guy? Oh, you got a vet guy. Who's that? And so our Rolodexes are like these giant thick things now, <laughs> and they're filled with people who are really good at one thing, which is partially why I think, you know, Rubio said what he said. He, he I don't know if he was pandering intentionally. I, I think it might have been. I, I wasn't. I wasn't there. But the debates, it seems like, it's a great moment it's set up because, for look, that. Yeah. You, I'm sure not a day goes by where you don't see these things, and you're going to see it a lot more in the next couple of months, yeah. you know, as you do your thing. But it just feels like in a rush to cut through, in a rush to be heard, we frame things in this, what Gutfeld calls it, a prison of two ideas, right? It's just everything is black or white, blue collar or white collar, this or that, you know? And that's a trap. And it's, it's part of the trap that has fueled the underlying uh, causes that have led to a great many of these symptoms that I think we now see as problems. It's well said. I mean, on, on, a, on a practical level, uh, as it relates to your, your work, through the nonprofit at least, how does that make you think about whether, even if you're training someone with skills-based, in a skills-based role, whether there's some room for, I don't know, 10% to be actually completely outside of that. Oh, I only bring that up because yes, there is this internet thing that we that that can be a portal to so much knowledge, but just in my own journey, maybe a lot of us go through this, I'll speak from my own experience, there is this thing of habituation too, right? Which is like curiosity, part of it's innate and part of it's inborn, but like most things you like virtue, you you only gain it through practicing it too. It's a muscle, right? And so, so it starts as a really tiny muscle, but it atrophies if you don't flex it early. And so, like, I wonder to follow, to make sure we don't fall into this prison of two two ideas, even in terms of what we practice here, like maybe liberal arts colleges need a few more classes in being a mechanic or carp need a carpenter class. But let's say the person training to be a carpenter maybe has like a, a course on on you know, Nietzsche, and maybe if that's not his speed, then maybe on World War II. Or maybe Frederick Hayek. Maybe let's take him down economics. Let's Yeah, look, exactly. It's, it's just, it's, like it's so true. You know? Right. But look, we kind of had it for a while, right? We had shop class in high schools for a very long time. And we had them there, even though we knew that maybe a majority, certainly a plurality of, of the kids there weren't going to be predisposed for a career in the trades. But we kept those classes present because we wanted everybody in that high school to at least see some optical proof that there was another part of the workforce that didn't require a suit and a tie and a cubicle and so forth. When we took shop class out of high school, we unleashed the Kraken. I can't think of anything that's led to more unintended consequences both to our workforce and to our educational system in general, than that one harebrained, hopelessly misguided decision. Was that a decision? Like, I'm actually curious now that you say that. How did it happen? I don't think some evil, wicked puppeteer was, you know, sitting in a corner twirling his mustache and laughing maniacally <laughs> as he implemented his master plan to screw up millions and millions of kids. Um, I think it came in part from budgetary issues, but mostly I think it came from a concerted PR campaign to elevate every other form of education. I think, and I, and I think this makes sense in the fifties and sixties, I think, you know, people sat down in power and, and said, look, we need more of our citizens, uh, pursuing what we'll call higher ed. We need more people. We need more engineers. We need more accountants, everything. Hell, back then we needed more lawyers too. And so there was a big push for that kind of credentialing. But 
and I'm going to come back to PR again and again with this because it matters. It gets dismissed all the time, but but it really matters. And college got the PR campaign it needed for about five years. And then we doubled down on it. We weren't content to simply say that, hey, this path to higher education is really, really good. We had to say, it's so good, everybody has to take it. And then we said, it's so good that if you don't take it, you're going to have to settle for something beneath you. And then we said, if we don't make it free for everybody, then we're bad and evil, right? And so this push for college got every rhetorical advantage imaginable for decades. And most of it came at the expense of every other form of education. And consequently, a, a long list of jobs that, surprise, surprise, are now are now really on the ropes. When was that five years? When was that? I mean, you said, now that I'm just interested in the history. I'm just guessing, but I'd say the sweet spot for an honest push for college probably happened in the early to mid 70s. Yep. Sounds about right to me. Yep. By 1979, I was a senior in high school and um, I was called down to the guidance counselor's office before graduation to have a chat with Mr. Dunbar about my future. And uh, Mr. Dunbar had seen my test. I'd say taken all the normal battery of tests that everybody had to take back then. And I did pretty well on them, apparently. And he was excited for me and, and wanted to walk me through the application process to uh, University of Maryland, James Madison, and Penn. And uh, I swear this is true, Vivek. I, I, I was sitting there just like, you can't be serious. A, I have no idea what I want to do. B, the only four-letter word in my family growing up that was really off limits was debt. And there was no way I was going to borrow money to go to any of those schools. I, I, didn't have, I didn't have two nickels to rub together. So I said, look, my plan, Mr. Dunbar, <laughs> is to go about two miles down the road to Essex Community College and take every class I can. Because at 26 bucks a credit, I could afford to be wrong about a lot. And of course I was, but by the time I got done, I had a much, much better idea of the direction I wanted to go in. And, and, and so I did. And a year later, I did go back and I got my degree. But that moment in Mr. Dunbar's office was really important. And I use it a lot in my foundation today because he had a poster on his wall that was part of the new push for college. And on this poster were two images. On the left-hand side was a college graduate, cap and gown, mortarboard, the whole thing. The sun is in his face. Everything's beautifully lit. And his horizon is just a, a thing of opportunity and hope. Next to him is a guy who's holding a wrench. And he looks like he's standing in the fifth level of hell. And he's kind of looking down at his feet like he had won some vocational consolation prize. And the caption, the caption on this thing said, work smart, not hard. And, it, and if you Google that today, you will see the power of a trope. That, that bromide is everywhere. I've spoken at conferences that are dedicated to, to that little bit of uh, mis... <laughs> well, terrible, terrible wis conventional Bad wisdom. wisdom. Bad wisdom. Bad yeah. wisdom. Yeah, That's yeah, what yeah. it is. That's what yeah. it is. So anyway, sorry to take the sidebar, but in that moment, when my guidance counselor pointed to that poster and said, which one of those guys do you want to be? That's, you know, I didn't realize it at that moment, but when I look back, I can see what what happened very clearly. Thousands of guidance counselors were asking tens of thousands of other kids the same question. Their thumb was on the scale. And to this day, guidance counselors are bonused, not on their ability to get kids into trade school, but in their ability to get kids into a four-year school. We're making the same goddamn mistake over and over and over. We're stuck. Mm -hmm. You know, I think... Um... You've persuaded me over the course of this conversation alone that language might actually matter and uh, on this debate. And I'm not sure how I feel about 
even the use of the word trades. You know, what does that mean, actually? Um, you know, the trade school versus professional school, why this distinction between a trade and a profession? What does it mean to sort of have intellectual curiosity if you're in a profession versus a trade? Maybe there is no profession versus a trade. Maybe that's a prison of two ideas in its own right. And or a distinction without a difference. A distinction without a difference, which is to say that they're just words and they don't mean anything and they don't have, they only, we only make them mean something by making real mistakes in the real world as a retrofitted way of trying to make otherwise meaningless words mean something and maybe the words should just stay meaningless. There's one other moment where this thing hit me like a ton of bricks. There was just so much clarity. I was backstage uh, at a big convention center in Indianapolis. This was 2008, and I was speaking to the fu uh, Future Farmers of America, right? It's their big annual convention, right? Um, 19,000 kids in this giant arena. And I'm standing backstage kind of preparing my, my thoughts, and one of the organizers walks up to me and hands me a, a typical brief, you know, just kind of put together on the organization, current thinking, best practices, and so forth. And on the front page, it says... As a matter of officialdom, we no longer refer to ourselves and would prefer not to be referred to as the future farmers of America. We are now the FFA. And I said, um, why? <laughs> and incredibly, the word farmer, to your point, in much the same way the word trades is, has become somewhat of, a, of an obstacle, the word farmer had become an impediment to their prime directive, which is to recruit kids into this organization to prepare the next generation of folks who grow our food. So we, the, the, these are two houses on the same street, you know, the future of the trades and the future of farming. And, you know, our country relies so incredibly on skilled tradespeople and the modern farmer. And both of these cohorts are struggling with language, myths, misperceptions, stigmas, and stereotypes that are making it difficult for them to swell their ranks. And we are all paying the price for it. And you can walk it right back to language. If we're living in a time, and we are, where farmer has become a bad word to farmers, <laughs> then we got to get the uh, wheels back on the bus. Amen. I love it. And uh, I love that you also kind of can speak from your own experience, Mike, and seeing this journey. It's why I uh, love talking to you. Oh, hopefully, this is the second of many more to come. I'm looking forward I'm to that. I'm at your disposal, you know, and, and good luck in your future you. adventure. How's it going, by the way? Last time we chatted, you said you were going to be remarkably transparent, never yeah. deliver a speech from prepared notes and document this whole hot mess you Forrest Gumped your way into. Yeah, I think we're doing that. Um, so I haven't given a prepared speech yet. <laughs> uh, the only time I've uh, looked into teleprompter is when I'm looking at a camera of someone like you and your face is on it, not some words. And, uh, you know, by any measure, we're, I mean, to be really honest with you, ahead of where we wanted to be from a campaign strategy. So we wanted to be in third place by the end of the year. I think we're looking at inching into third place in most of the national polling now if not soon. And, uh, you know, I'll be at the debate stage in August. And I think that turns the race upside down and we're going to, you know, in my, my view is I'd rather speak truth, as, to your point about transparency, I'd rather speak truth at every step of the way and lose an election rather than to play some political snakes and ladders and win. My, my gut instinct from traveling the country right now, at least, is actually that is the winning strategy, but we're going to find out. And I'm, and I'm curious. I, I think it is, but that's what, that's what we're doing. That's what I'm doing. And that's what I'm going to keep doing. And we'll see how far it gets us. Well, all you're talking about is, uh, what is that word? Integrity, I think it is. Yeah. <laughs> what is that yeah. word? <laughs> see, see if it's still for sale. Yeah, we'll, uh, we'll, fi uh, we'll, we'll find out. Um, but that's, that's, that's the experiment we're running. So Love it. I appreciate it, Mike. I'm Vivek Ramaswamy, candidate for president, and I approve this message. Paid for by Vivek 2024.